government will have to find an option to address the issue of funding for aviation services, whose allocation was cut by the opposition during the consideration of the 2014 national budget estimates. Interior domestic airstrips are critical to hinterland communities, mining and forestry sectors, and for scientific research and tourism, which continue to expand. The government will find alternative measures to address the issue of funding for aviation services as a result of the budget cut. We, of course, and we on our side of the parliament, on the Pacific side, the government side, we are distressed, of course, by anything which impacts negatively on interior development. The, the development, the maintenance of um, interior domestic air transport is critical for our country, for Armenian communities, hinterland communities, for mining and forestry and other scientific research, for tourism, which we know is a growth pole now for Guyana. So any cuts with respect to that area is grievous to the country. Using their one-seat majority on April 10, the opposition voted against the budgetary allocation of $6.5 billion for the aviation sector. That vote also affected funding for other aviation services, including $235 million for the same heading with the Chetty Jagan International Airport for rehabilitation of airstrips as well as for the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority. We would have to find ways to... Uh, somehow getting around this issue, and I know the Ministry of Finance is looking at this with, with respect to the mishaps which have occurred. Uh, we have to continue to work with the industry to make sure that they do all the necessary steps to make sure that flying is safe and sustainable in the country. It is indeed basically safe. Uh, we would have to compare the amount of movements, aircraft movements, which occur now compared to some years ago. The number of aircraft movements has increased fivefold when compared to five years ago. Domestic air travel out of Ogle Airport itself and even interior flight movements from Madia and the Pakarimas have dramatically increased. Of an elite athlete program was addressed during a three day sports management workshop facilitated by the sports ministry to engage sports administrators. In an effort to heighten sports education in Guyana, the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport launched a three day sports management workshop designed for sport administrators to gain a greater understanding of the management of sports events, teams, and application of sports. The event, which was held at the Resort Center Lecture Hall, Wolford Avenue, focused on areas such as reviewing and revitalizing sports structure, sports administrators, and nation-building strengthening sports association, and developing elite athlete program, among others. Facilitators of the event include renowned athletes Alto Boldon of Trinidad and Tobago, and Graceland Jackson of Jamaica, Kathleen Ratchery, June Ruder, and Vice President of the National Sports Commission, Karen Pilgrim. Sports were already begun uh, in leaps and months. And in some ways, we are still trying the old things. And that is not going to work for us in this new century. So if we are really going to modernize the way that we do things, we have to open ourselves to new ideas. And we have to adapt those new ideas and adapt how we do things uh, here in the end. We feel that seminars like this would help to catalyze that kind of change that we want to see here again. A lot of how we train people here, we have not been using science to train people in sports here. Because of that, you will find that sometimes athletes are overworked, probably working the wrong muscle groups. We're not teaching them about physiology or anatomy or anything of the sort. And therefore, when they go out to compete, we wonder perhaps why they're failing. The sports ministry will also be looking at the possibility of having more workshops, seminars and lectures, sharing of information and experiences to ensure that athletes are well equipped to perform in their respective disciplines. I do believe that this is the first time 
in Grand's history that we would have had so distinguished a panel, and I use the word of panelists, to address us. We have Ms. Grace Jackson, Mr. Arthur Bolton, Ms. Samuel, all Olympians. And you have other distinguished panelists who are here to teach us and to let us know what should be done practically for the development of sports in the area. I'm very pleased about this and I sincerely hope that at the end of this particular workshop, each of you will go back to your respective associations and be able to implement and plan what you have brought here. It has long been recognized that information gathering in the field of sport is critical in development knowledge as it relates to the various disciplines. And in this regard, the ministry over the years has been developing a necessary infrastructure as a means for a better sports preparation and performance of the nation's sportsmen and women in the various disciplines. Over the next few months, a sum of $100 million will be expended for much needed rehabilitation work on Lurupin Pier Cemetery as efforts are made to restore the city's main burial site. The much-needed works on the Lerpimeter Cemetery are expected to commence shortly as the Ministry of Local Government has already begun advertising for tenders for the cleanup effort. Local Government Minister Norman Whitaker said that the sum of $100 million will be spent during the restoration. The bushing of cemeteries, planting of trees, removal of obstacles from parapets and reserves. These are the key, the principal activities. Works to be undertaken will include the clearing of overgrown bushes, resurfacing of roadways and drainage clearing. According to the minister, already tenders have been identified for the clearing of drains, main canals and the resurfacing of roadways. Over the years, the main burial site in the city has deteriorated under the watch of the mayor and city council. Meanwhile, the minister said that the complete rehabilitation works of the burial site are expected to be completed by year end. The money which is being spent on this project is being used from the $500 million allocated during the 2014 national budget for a massive city cleanup exercise. The Ministry of Health has been working endlessly to create new means to further strengthen the fight against cervical cancer. Recently, it partnered with the Guyana Responsible Parenthood Association to launch a BIA regional training and campaign. This training, which is funded by the International Planned Parenthood Federation, saw representatives of the medical field from several Caribbean countries joining with local health practitioners to undergo a week of training in this regard. Several staff from health facilities are taking part in this training. These include representatives from the Georgetown Public Hospital Cooperation and the St. Joseph Marcy Hospital, as well as health practitioners from Brazil, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, and Suriname and St. Lucia. It's a, a lot of way in a single visit approach which can reach, which can have a wide reach of uh, women across Guyana and which is very affordable and where you get quick results and quick treatment which is really needed for us to address the problem of cervical cancer. At GRPA we launched this for the first time, we'll be doing this and we're launching this as we post a training, a regional training, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the Georgetown Public Hospital. We have um, a regional training taking place, actually it started on Monday, and we have persons, doctors and nurses from Belize, and, and they're all here, but, okay, Belize, um, Trinidad, Grenada, uh, Suriname, St. Lucia, and of course our own from Guyana, from our clinic, from Mercy Hospital, from the GPHC. Cervical cancer is caused by HPV virus, which is sexually transmitted, especially amongst young people. Guyana has the third highest rate of cervical cancer in the Western Hemisphere. The ministry has made available HPV vaccinations to females starting from age 9 in 2012, because studies have shown that the vaccination works better in females who take the shot before becoming sexually active. Recently, the administration introduced on 11th of January 2012 its latest vaccine, the HPV vaccine. And I want to tell you that our public health nurses did such, and other workers did such a good job that we had only three misguided people coming to make some protests outside of the Ministry of Health. And I, within half an hour, they were gone. As a matter of fact, I, we didn't even know it. 
and it's caught on. We have we have even older women asking for the HPV vaccine. As you know, we've introduced it for the 9 to 11 cohort of young ladies because of the science related to the HPV vaccine too. So we've had a good uptake. We had a good uptake and we want to, we want to keep pushing that. The GRPA will be offering free screening and treatment from June 18 to 20 at the GRPA clinic along with the police association and from June 19 to 21 at the GPHC. These exercises will be carried out between 8 hours to 12 hours daily. Stay tuned more of the weekly digest after the break. In an effort to respond more promptly to citizens, the Home Affairs Ministry has launched an online crime reporting system which allows citizens who possess or have access to cell phones, computers or other devices with internet connections to report criminal activities. Citizens can get instant access to security personnel on BlackBerry Messenger via 2804E429. Reports of corruption can also be made on www.ipaythebribe.com. These reports can be made anonymously. By cutting the administrative arm of the Office of the President's funding, the allocation for the provision of the Head of State Security has been removed. This action can compromise the security of President Donald Ramutar. This move sets a dangerous precedent and is unacceptable for any head of state, government, or right-thinking people of a democratic nation. Ghana is set to achieve the goal set by the United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF of universal birth registration by 2050. The General Register Office has launched an intensive campaign. It has decentralized its services to specifically cater to the needs of residents living in the interior location. Bedside registration is also done in several public hospitals. There are now 200 registration centers operating in the 10 regions. Citizens are urged to ensure that all births are registered. The opposition's disapproval of monies for the Office of the President has affected several agencies such as the Civil Defense Commission. This agency deals with managing and assisting persons and communities affected by disasters natural and man-made. The move to disapprove funding for the CDC means that if any disaster were to occur, the government would not be able to provide any assistance to those in need. Nations Development Program representative has lauded Guyana's effort as it relates to its achievements made thus far under the United Nations Development Assistance Framework Initiative. On June 18, several stakeholders convened at the Grand Coastal Inn where they discussed the midterm review of the UNDAF 2012 to 2016 initiative. In moving forward, the United Nations country representative, Ms. Khadija Musa, said that greater effort will be needed to ensure better results. After intensive review, we believe that the UNDAF is still aligned uh, to the country priorities as outlined in Guyana's national development strategy. Many results have already been achieved, but since we are only still midway, there are still much more to be done. Greater efforts will be needed to ensure strengthening joint collaboration monitoring and reporting on the UNDAF, increased uh, rigor and widely wide-ranging partnership uh, will be needed to fast-track the achievement of the lagging MDG goal. Ms. Musa told stakeholders that as Ghana enters the last lap to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, the UN remains committed towards enhancing efforts to achieve greater coherence, reduced duplication, and to continue to provide quality technical services to partners. What happens in the end of this uh, next two years, which will complete this UNDAF uh, cycle, is very important. And what we learn from uh, the implementation of this cycle will feed into the future. And considering that if it becomes a reality, that Guyana indeed opts for delivering as one country, uh, that will be very, very important evaluation in the end of uh, the next two years. And we hope that we will work very closely with civil society, uh, government partners, and private sector in putting together a new vision at, at 2016. The UNDAF is a collective response of United Nations agencies within Guyana to agree developmental priorities and covers the period 2012 to 2016. 
The midterm review examined the first two and a half years of the program cycle and aims to both determine the status of implementation and propose any modifications, reorientations, or recommendations for the remainder of the program. The four thematic areas of the UNDAF and their outputs are environmental and sustainable development, inclusive growth, inclusive governance, and human and social development. Diana, already blacklisted by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CPATEC, faces further sanctions this month after the parliamentary opposition again refused to support the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism bill. A compliant anti-money laundering legislation is an absolute must in order for the country to exit the blacklisting trap which it is currently in. The anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism bill was fully approved by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF. However, the non-support of the opposition resulted in the penalty of Guyana being blacklisted. CFATF said that Guyana must pass the relevant legislation to fully criminalize money laundering and terrorist financing offenses, as well as strengthen the requirements for suspicious transaction reporting, international cooperation and the freezing and confiscation of terrorist assets, and fully implementing the UN conventions. We continue to work very hard in the parliament to secure passage of the money laundering legislation. Our government's position is clear. We are ready to enact CFATF compliant legislation immediately at the next sitting. We've been meeting as a committee, including most recently last night. That meeting went on quite late. The opposition is still holding on to some of their demands, demands that will in fact place Guyana into further non-compliance with CFATF stand, um, uh, prescriptions and will in fact place our country in an even more perilous position. We've tried to argue, explain that to them. They are in possession of correspondence from CFATF that has indicated quite clearly that some of what they are proposing will in fact bring Guyana into collision with CFATF even further. The Paris-based International Financial Action Task Force, IFATF, is due to meet from the 22nd to the 27th June to consider, among other things, a review of the implementation of measures taken by a number of countries to address deficiencies identified in the last round of mutual evaluation report. What is significant about this meeting is that Guyana will not be able to take a CFATF compliant legislation to the plenary meeting, which will contribute to a heightening of blacklisting of Guyana and its financial sector. Passing the bill itself will not automatically extricate us from the conundrum in which we are placed. Once you come under C F Financial Action Task for supervision, it is a process and it takes a time to graduate out of that process. And I don't think that Guyana is so special that anyone will have an accelerated exit or they are going to provide Guyana with some expedient way of extricating itself. We will have to go through the normal process. The further blacklist on Guyana will have several impacts. Among some will be persons who receive remittances, cash via money transfer systems, may experience delays in receiving the transfer. Proof of income and identification of the sender of such remittances will be enhanced. Persons most likely to be affected by this are undocumented aliens who reside abroad. Transfer of money from local to external banks will be delayed as international banks begin to sever ties locally. This delay in bank transfers or severing of financial ties with local banks can affect fuel prices and ultimately the cost for travel and commodities. Local businesses may experience delays in the shipment of goods as additional paperwork will be required to prove that a business is legitimate. Enhanced scrutiny will be implemented to verify the source and destination of all monies. Persons who shop online and use debit and credit cards to conduct such transactions may find their transactions are denied or delayed. Insurance services, fire, life, mortgage, etc. are also expected to experience delays, additional filing of paperwork and possibly increased fees. University of Guyana law students have finally been admitted to the U Wooden Law School after several months of uncertainty, which had caused current heads of government to seek a resolution. 
Following government's intervention, the top 25 Guyanese nationals, graduates of the University of Guyana Law Program 2013, will be given automatic entry into U. Wooding Law School for the academic year September 2013 to 2014. On behalf of Guyana, I requested that, I made two requests. First of all, that the agreement be renewed, but that it be renewed with amendments amendments which were designed to increase the intake from 25 to a lar larger number. An additional 10 students who are non-Guyanese nationals graduating out of the said program will enjoy automatic entry into Norman Manley or Eugenie Dupok Law School, depending on which zone their territory falls. These decisions came following a meeting which was held by way of teleconference and was convened at the CARICOM Secretariat Turkine. Earlier this year, Minister Nandlal, during a meeting with UG Law students, had promised to find a permanent solution to the problem facing them as it relates to entry into the U-Wood in Law School. Via the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dispatched a letter to the CARICOM Secretariat seeking their intervention. President Ramotar also began to use diplomatic channels to engage the heads of government and those who were in charge of the agenda of the heads of government meeting which just concluded in St. Vincent to place that this issue on the agenda. But though provisions have been made for 2014, current UG law students remain concerned over the future relationship between the UG and the U Wooden Law School. Chairman of CARICOM, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, spearheaded the talks to seek a resolution on the issue. Stay tuned, more of the Weekly Digest after the break. In an effort to respond more promptly to citizens, the Home Affairs Ministry has launched an online crime reporting system which allows citizens who possess or have access to cell phones, computers or other devices with internet connections to report criminal activities. Citizens can get instant access to security personnel on BlackBerry Messenger via 2804E429. Reports of corruption can also be made on www.ipaythebribe.com. These reports can be made anonymously. Ghana is set to achieve the goal set by the United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF of universal birth registration by 2050. The General Register Office has launched an intensive campaign. It has decentralized its services to specifically cater to the needs of residents living in the interior location. Bedside registration is also done in several public hospitals. There are now 200 registration centers operating in the 10 regions. Citizens are urged to ensure that all births are registered. National concern were discussed. The media was subsequently briefed on cabinet's deliberations. At its statutory meeting on June 17, Cabinet gave its no objections to 10 contracts in the housing and water, agriculture, public works, and culture, youth, and sports sectors. As provided for by the Constitution and on the basis of the ruling of the High Court, the Finance Minister has moved to restore funds that were voted down by the opposition. The Constitution specifically addresses expenditure and shortages, inadequacy for agencies in discharging their work program in any fiscal year. And the Constitution does offer remedies that we have collectively termed restoration, but of course it carries with it this term restoration, the specifics of the constitutional remedies. And that is to say that restoration indeed refers to a range of constitutional remedies to provide for expenditure that has not been appropriated in any fiscal year. 
By disapproving the main capital program for the office of the president, the opposition has essentially crippled the head of state office from carrying out its constitutional, executive, and moral obligations. The government is encouraged by the voluntary statements made by opposition leader David Granger with regards to the Rodney COI and his party's move to participate in the process. Cabinet welcomed for the evidence of the abandonment of the APNU, PNC, of their earlier position of not supporting the Commission of Inquiry, and we saw that with the assignment, if that is the right word, or retention, probably, for Mr. Basil Williams, the attorney, to represent the interests of the PNC and APNU at the hearings. Mr. Granger's contributions made in the media was noted by cabinet and cabinet remained unclear about whether retired Brigadier Granger public comments would be followed by greater commitments, more commitments to the achievement of the TORs of the commission. Meanwhile, all efforts to get the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill passed in the National Assembly before the Financial Action Task Force's plenary next week have been futile. What is significant about that loss is for whatever worth, for whatever worth it provided, a CFATF FATF legislation taken to the FATF plenary that is occurring next week. I'm not certain where. I knew where it should have been. I don't know where it will be. But the CFATF plenary next week. And the opportunity of Guyana appearing with CFATF legislation is also lost. It goes without saying that for whatever it was worth, that loss is going to conform, it is going to contribute to a heightening of blacklisting of Guyana and its financial sector.